Hello friends, uh, welcome to IS at Speed of Light and uh, this is a part 3 of Indian Polity Conceptual. Uh, we are studying the fundamental rights in the part 3 of Indian Constitution and last time we have completed it, article number 16 which dealt with the right to equality in measure of public employment. Now we are starting with article number 17 and uh, let us read the article number 17 from PM Bakshi, page number 39. It talks about, uh, the article talks about the abolition of untouchability. It says untouchability is abolished and its practice is any form is forbidden. The enforcement of any disabilities arising out of untouchability shall be an offense punishable in accordance with law. So lastly, last sentence it is saying the punishable in accordance with law which has to be made by the parliament. Now punishable in accordance with law and this law has to be made by parliament and in turn of that the parliament has made the untouchability offenses act 1955 which was revamped again in 1976 as the civil rights protection act. So this way it defines what is untouchability. Untouchability is not mere the practice of un, uh, practice uh, which is followed of untouchability, but it is actually the disabilities imposed on certain social sessions because of their birth in a particular caste. And the following are considered as the examples of the offenses under untouchability. First one is refusing admission to any person to the public institutions. Second insulting a member of a particular caste on untouchability grounds so insulting a particular member of a particular caste on untouchability grounds not allowing a member of a particular caste to worship in place of public worship and preaching untouchability directly or indirectly so these all things are considered as untouchability as a practice of untouchability. Now, what are the punishments which have been prescribed by the Act for the practice of untouchability? First one is minimum six months of jail. The person who is found uh, to be guilty of this uh, uh, this Act, he is debarred from contesting any election in the country. This is a very important and a significant point. He is not allowed uh, to contest for any election in the country if he is found guilty of uh, practicing untouchability. Court proceeds with the assumption of guilt of accused. Again, this is a very important point. In normal circumstances, court proceeds with the assumption that the person who is there until and till he is proves guilty, he is innocent. But here it is other way around. Court proceeds with the assumption of guilt of accused. This is a cognizance which is no warrant is required to arrest. Police doesn't require any warrant to arrest. It is not compoundable, which means no compromise is sought between the parties. Again, it is uh, other way around. Normally, uh, other cases, a compromise is normally sought between the two parties. It is the right against both the state and private individual. So, one, how we are the bifurcating each law, this law. A person uh, we have against both state and private individuals and not only against the state. So this is article number 17. Uh, let us move to article number 18 quickly and uh, it is on page number 40. It says about abolition of titles. So article 18 part 1 it says no title not being a military or academic distinction shall be confirmed by the state. So what it means is no title except military or academic uh, distinction uh, can be given by the state. So what it infers is private people they can confer these titles not the state. Okay indirectly it means that. So no titles except military or academic distinction to be given by the state. Second uh, part 2 it says no citizen of India shall accept any title from foreign state. Again they are talking about the citizen of India they should not accept any title from foreign state. Same way Sunil Gavaskar uh, refused to uh, take the title sir under a knighthood award. Coming to the part 3 uh, it says no person who is not a citizen of India now here they are talking about the person who is not a citizen of India uh, while he holds any office of profit or trust under the state 
accept without the consent of the president any title from any foreign state so again this is self explanatory if a person who is not the citizen of india but he is holding any office of profit or trust under the indian state he cannot uh, accept any present emolument or office of any kind from or under any foreign state accept the consent of or accept the permission of president part 4 if we see 18 part 4 no person holding any office any office of profit or trust under the state shall without the consent of president accept any present emolument or office of any kind from or under any state now in nutshell if we uh, uh, talk about the article it clearly means all titles uh, whether national or foreign which create artificial distinctions uh in the social status of a particular person or uh, amongst the whole society among the people uh, have been abolished by this article and this provision has been included in the constitution uh, to do away with the uh, normal titles hereditary titles like rai sahib raja rai bahadur which we have seen which were confirmed by the britishers of few indians uh, as their reward for their effective cooperation uh, to the colonial rule So this practice of conferring titles like this uh, is against the doctrine of equality before law. So that is why it has been included under the right to equality uh, in fundamental rights. Uh, but to recognize meritorious services uh, rendered by the individual uh, citizens uh, to the country or to the whole mankind, the President of India confers civil and military awards on those uh, individuals for their services and achievements. Um, uh we know bharat ratna padma vibhushan padma shri padam vir chakra vir chakra uh, and these doesn't uh, come under the word title which have been described uh, in article number 18 this decision was given in a landmark judgment balaji versus union of india 1996 that uh, distinctions or the titles like bharat ratna which is in table of precedence is at ninth number in table of order of precedence table of order of precedence what we have studied in the monics as well and which is as important part uh, and have been regularly asked in various exams order of uh, table of order of precedence padma vibhushan padma shri okay so uh, this is the article number 18 which uh, says the abolition of titles and it is a part of right of equality now let us move to right to freedom now we have finished the right to equality which we have said initially it is from article number 14 to article number 18 now comes the right to freedom which is from article number 19 to uh, article number 22 and one of the most important part of the fundamental rights of indian constitution coming to the <coughs> article number 19 uh, let us uh, read from pm bakshi page number 41 article number 19 it says the protection of certain rights regarding freedom of speech etc the first part of article 19 all citizens shall have the right sub part a to freedom of speech and expression to assemble peacefully and without arms to form associates or unions or cooperative societies or cooperative societies this particular word has been added in this article by a very recent uh, amendment done and uh, which is a 97th constitutional amendment act 2011 to move freely throughout the territories of india parts of part e reside and settle in any parts of india and practice any profession freedom of uh, profession so these are the fundamental rights uh, which are given in uh, the article number 19 part 1 now if we see part 2 part 3 part 4 part 5 part 6 these are all the exceptions of uh, these articles 
let us see now the freedom of speech and expression and let's have a, a small discussion on that now this is the freedom of speech and expression is a very important freedom which is granted by the uh, constitution to the citizens of india and which is a very basic right uh, this freedom uh, it ensures free and uh, frank speeches uh, discussions and exchange of uh, one's own opinion uh, it includes uh, also the freedom of press however these freedoms uh, like freedom of speech and expression are not absolute and the state is empowered uh, to impose reasonable restrictions on the exercise of these rights in the interest of uh, the security of the state public order and morality etc now if we read the part 2 19 part 2 um, again page number 41 pm bakshi says nothing in sub clause a of clause 1 shall affect the operation of any existing law or prevent the state from making any law in so far as such law imposes reasonable restrictions on the exercise of the rights confirmed by the sub clause that is sub clause a which is the freedom of speech and expression in the interest of the sovereignty and the integrity of india the security of the state friendly relations with the foreign states the public order decency or morality or in relation to contempt of court defamation or incitement to an offence so these are the uh, uh restrictions which uh, on, on these are the grounds of the restrictions on which a government can curtail your freedom of sp speech and expression now here one more thing we can understand which is the concept of inferred rights now for example uh, uh we have a fundamental right of freedom to speech and expression so this also infer we have right to silence which is an inferred right if we have right uh, to freedom of speech and expression then we also have a right to silence uh, now explaining the scope of uh, freedom of speech and expression uh, the supreme court in various judgments has said the word freedom of speech and expression it must be broadly uh, made out or it must be broadly constructed uh, to include the freedom to circulate one own views uh, by a word uh, or by mouth or the in writing also or through audio visual instruments so it therefore includes a right to propagate one's views through the print media as well or to any other communication channel uh, like uh, the radio or the televisions so every citizen in this country therefore has the right to air his or their views through the printing or through the electronic media subject of course to the uh the permissible restrictions uh, imposed under article uh, 19 part 2 which is uh, the restrictions imposed on the freedom to speech and uh, expression now another thing important thing to discuss under the this part uh, sub part a of freedom of speech and expression it is the freedom of press so the fundamental right of uh, the freedom of press uh, it is implicit uh, in the right uh, of freedom of speech and expression and we know that it is very essential for the political liberty and the proper functioning of uh, the democracy and unlike in the american constitution in american constitution this particular right of uh, freedom of press it has been explicitly mentioned whereas in our indian constitution article 1 sub part a Uh, it doesn't explicitly uh, mention the liberty of the press but it has been held that liberty of press is included uh, in the freedom of speech and expression so uh, <clears throat> for example now editor of a press uh, uh, for the manager is merely exercising the right of the expression and therefore no specific mention is necessary for the freedom of press in the indian constitution and the freedom of press we know it is a heart of uh, social and political intercourse and uh, it is a primary uh, duty of uh, the state and of the judiciary to uphold the freedom of press and invalidate all laws or administrative actions which interface with it contrary to the constitutional mandate now let us see uh, uh, part 2 of uh, 19 which is uh, the restrictions on fundamental uh, right of freedom of speech and expression the first thing what uh, 
it says is state can impose uh, restrictions uh, based on or in the interest of the security of the state now under article 19 sub part 2 these noble restrictions it can be imposed on the freedom of speech and expression in the interest of security of state it has been written now the term security of state it refers only to serious and aggravated forms of public order for example uh, like rebellion or waging war against the state insurgent and not ordinary breaches of public order and public safety like that or unlawful assembly thus speeches or expressions on that part of an individual uh, which incite okay or to which encourage the commission of violent crimes such as murders okay such as murders or uh, matters uh, which would undermine the security of the state so it is a broader term and it won't uh, mean the, the minor offenses uh, the security of state now second term what it says is a friendly relations uh, with the, the foreign states now this uh, ground uh, on which the state can impose uh, restrictions on the fundamental right it was added by the constitution for amendment first amendment act which was in 1951 the objective behind this provision uh, was to prohibit uh, unrestrained malicious uh, propaganda uh, against a foreign friendly state okay which may jeopardize the maintenance of uh, good relations between india and uh, of that state no similar provision uh, is present in any other constitution of the world and in india the foreign we have one uh, foreign relations act uh, it provides punishment for libel by indian citizens against foreign dignitaries and other restrictions as we have taught public order decency or morality or the in relation to contempt of court now here another th- important thing which uh, we need to understand is uh, a fine balance between the press and the contempt of court uh, press and contempt of uh, court and this what we want to discuss is uh, press should not reach to the level uh, under the freedom of his speech and expression that it will contempt uh, it will do the contempt of court by Uh, criticizing the decisions taken by the court or to see criticizing the uh, the judgments as such and not judges so it is very important to have a fine balance between the freedom of press freedom of or liberty of press and the contempt of uh, a court in another uh, one very important case uh, the communist party of india cpi versus bharat kumar case uh, uh, supreme court has ruled that the band which are normally called by the political parties it is not uh, uh, freedom of speech and expression i would like i would suggest you to go through all the notes of article 14 and article 19 Which are very two very important articles of fundamental rights. Notes which are given in the PM Bakshi, the various important judgments uh, regarding that uh, particular article. Okay, so let us go to the second uh, one, which says assemble peacefully and without arms. Uh, this is very self-explanatory. A uh, freedom of assembly. Again, it is not absolute, uh, but it is restricted, and the assembly must be non-violent and must not cause any breach of uh, public peace. And if assembly is righteous, and then it is not protected against the uh, Article One, Subpart B, and reasonable restrictions, it may be imposed. Now, this again, if we see uh, the third part of nineteen, uh, it gives the uh, restrictions which can be imposed by the state uh, to assemble peacefully and without arms. coming to the third part which is to form associations and uh, unions uh, and uh, which cooperative society which has been added uh, as a fundamental right uh, by the latest constitution amendment act 97 2011 these constitution amendment acts are very important to remember uh, now freedom to form associations it includes uh, association of uh, political or social or it may be cultural in nature now further it also gives the right to join or not join associations or right to continue or not continue with any associations uh, it gives a right to form trade unions 
while if when we will study article 33 of the constitution it empowers uh, to pass a law restricting the right to form political associations to members of armed forces or the persons who are employed in any bureaus or the security forces uh, which are established by the state for the purpose of intelligence or counterintelligence uh persons who are employed in that or in connections with the telecommunications which are which are very essential for the security of the state so uh we have uh, form uh, right to form associations or unions uh, or cooperative societies uh, while article 33 when we will study we will see it uh, uh, put it restrictions of uh, joining uh, people who are there in sensitive positions or who are in security forces to form associations or unions now fourth is uh, move freely throughout the territories of india again it the freedom of movement it guarantees uh, to the citizens the right to move freely throughout the territory of india but this again can be restricted on the grounds of security public order or for protecting the interests of scheduled tribes okay so if you see uh, sub part 4 of uh, artic- article 19 sub part a uh, part 4 uh, it is part 5 now we are relating it with a to move freely throughout the country of india so if last line you read either in the interest of general public or for the protection or interest of any scheduled tribes same way to reside and settle in any part of the territory we have an exception which says restrictions on basis of the protection of uh, the interest of scheduled tribes so dne public order and scheduled tribes interests of scheduled tribes so restrictions can be put on these two for the protection of these public order and uh, uh, scheduled tribes and now the last one is the freedom of trade and occupation again it guarantees all citizens the right to choose any profession occupation trade or business but again this right uh, is restricted by the state under clause number 6 uh, which includes imposing reasonable restrictions in interests of general public or prescribing professional or technical uh, qualifications which are necessary for carrying out uh, any profession trade or business uh, to the exclusion of private citizens uh, wholly or uh, partially okay this is again self explanatory So this was uh, the article number nineteen, and these article are available only to citizens and shareholders of the companies, but not available to foreigners or legal persons. So again, this uh, important point to note. Coming to the article number twenty, uh, under the right to freedom, and uh, let us read it from uh, P. M. Bakshi, uh, page number fifty-two. protection in respect of convention for offences so let us see what this article wants to tell us uh, first it says no person shall be convicted of any offence except for a violation of a law in force at the time of commission of the act charged as an offence okay so first thing it is available to citizens foreigners and all legal persons it is saying no person so no person is a wider connotation which includes citizen foreigners or legal persons like companies corporations etc the first it gives uh, 20 part 1 it gives two information first information is says except for a violation of a law in force at the time of commission of the act so conviction only for the violation of law which is in the force at the time of the crime second thing what it says is <clears throat> not be subjected to a penalty greater than that which might have been inflicted under the law in force at the time of the commission of the offence again the punishment should not be more than the law which is in force at the time of crime so this gives us the fundamental of ex facto law so what it uh, means is if i take example if we commit certain crime in uh, if we have committed certain crime in 2012 and uh, now 2014 uh, one new act some one new uh, act uh, was being implemented by the parliament now it gives more punishment of that act but i did that crime in 2012 so i will be getting punishment i'll be getting conviction as per the law which was there in 2012 and not in 2014 or 
So this is no X factor law and this is applicable only in case of the criminal laws. Criminal laws they can't be applied retrospectively while civil laws they can be applied retrospectively. So this is a broad difference. Let us see the part 2 of uh, the article number 20. It says no person shall be prosecuted and punished for the same offense more than once. Okay, So for same offense I cannot be punished twice. So this is also known as double jeopardy. Uh, part 3 it says no person accused of any offense shall be complete to be witnessed against himself so no compulsion to witness against himself so in nutshell if we talk about this article uh, this provision it assures protection against the arbitrary arrest okay, by the executives and excessive punishment to any person who is alleged to have committed an offense and no person shall be punished except for the violation of law which is in force when the crime was committed the year or the time when the crime was committed an accused cannot be compelled to be a witness against uh, himself or herself and no person shall be punished for the same offense more than once okay so this is in nutshell what this article tells us and prevent us from arbitrary arrests and punishments. Let us go to the article number 21 and uh, read it. This is a most important and a wide connotation article. It covers a wide degree of uh, uh, important basic liberties. The first one it says uh, the protection, article number 21, protection of life and personal liberty. No person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to the procedure established by law. Let us understand it. What it wants to say is, no person, okay, if citizen or foreigner, anyone, shall be deprived of his life or his personal liberty or freedom unless and until they it is a procedure established by law so what it means is it protects us from the executive action but what if a parliament give a law so with that procedure or with that law our this freedom or protection of life and personal liberty we can be deprived of okay so this is a very important part only this particular question also came before Supreme Court uh, in this uh, case of A.K. Gopalan versus State of Madras 1950 and uh, uh, it said as what we said procedure established by law so there is no protection against the legislative action and it is the only protection against the arbitrary executive action and not by law which is arbitrary legislative action but then this uh, uh, judgment it reversed in Menka Gandhi versus Union of India case 1976 and it said this particular protection of life and uh, personal liberty it it is also available against the arbitrary legislative action now this law whatever parliament will prescribe it has to be reasonable it has to be fair it has to be justified and who will decide this of course the supreme court if any law which which is passed by parliament uh, and which uh, infringes the uh, protection of life and personal liberty of uh, a citizen or the non-citizen this law can be challenged or the, the judiciary has the power to see whether this law is reasonable or fair or justified Supreme Court has held that this particular article, article number 21, it is of the widest amplitude, it's of widest coverage and it covers variety of uh, rights which are very important or which are very basic for the dignified life of a person. Uh, for, for example, uh, this article also includes to live life with a human dignity, uh, pollution free environment is our uh, right uh, to a dignified life livings the right to health right to free legal aid to travel abroad now when we saw the article number 19 article number 19 let's go back to that 
Article number 19, it said uh, part D, it said the move freely throughout the territories of India. So this fundamental right is giving us the power to move freely within the territory of India. Now to travel abroad, it is covered under article number 21. Okay, so to travel abroad, well article 19, part D, first D, it says to move within India. A fair trial in the courts, uh, the right to women to get decent living, etc. So these are uh, the inferred rights from the protection of life and personal liberty. Uh, then we have Article 21A, uh, which was added by the 86th Constitutional Amendment Act 2002 and again a very important amendment act to remember. It provides free and compulsory education for all children of the age of uh, 6 to 14. Earlier this particular provision it was there in the Directive Principle of State Policy Part 4 uh, of Article uh, 45 uh, but uh, being a Directive Principle it was not enforceable by the uh, or it was not justifiable but now being a fundamental right there is a scope of judicial review there is a, uh, a scope of judicial intervention into this particular thing uh, and to enable this Parliament of India they passed uh, Right to Education Bill uh, in 2009 and according to that law 25% of the seats have to be reserved for the economically backward section even in the private institutions only exception being the minority institution in which this particular thing doesn't apply now in article uh, 45 when you will see directive principle state policy uh, it now reads the state shall endeavor to provide early childhood care uh, for education and care from the children from the age of uh, 0 to 6 that is the childhood so from 0 to 6 years uh, it is under directive principle of state policy while for the age of 6 to 14 it is under the fundamental rights and it has also included uh, one fundamental duty which we will see when we will study the fundamental duties uh, so this was about the right to education article number 21 a very important question uh, especially for state services they will directly ask which is the following is the right to education. Let us go to article number 22 and uh, see uh, what it want to tell us. Article number 22. If you get can time, you can go through all these notes, uh, the important parts of these notes uh, which are the NPM Bakshi. Protection against arrest and detention in certain cases. Let us read the article now, 22 part 1. Uh, no person who is arrested shall be detained in custody without being informed. So first thing what it is saying is, uh, it, we have the right to be informed in case of arrest. So if police comes to arrest me, they have to tell on, the which, on which grounds they are arresting me. So this is the first right it is confirming that who is arrested shall be detained in custody without being informed. Now as soon as may be of the grounds of such arrest, nor shall he be denied the right to consult and to be defended by a legal petitioner of his choice. Now second thing what it is telling us is, we have right to consult and defend it by a legal petitioner. Okay. So these two things, first part is telling us the right to be informed in case of others and right to consult and defend it by a legal petitioner. Let us read part two of this. Every person who is arrested and detained in custody shall be produced before the nearest magistrate within a period of 24 hours of such arrest, excluding the time necessary for the journey from the place to the of arrest to the court of magistrate. So what it says is, after the arrest we have the right to be produced before the magistrate within 24 hours excluding the journey time right now second what it says is and no such person shall be detained in custody beyond the set period without the authority of magistrate now we can't be detained in custody unless the magistrate authorize after 24 hours okay so these two things, this article number 22, part 2, which is telling us. Now part 3, if we see, nothing in clause 1 and 2 shall apply to, to any person 
who for the time being is an enemy alien so it doesn't apply to enemy aliens second thing to any person who is arrested or detained under any law provided for preventive detention or in case of preventive detentions these two above laws will not be applicable now there are concept of punitive detention and preventive detention now punitive detention it is uh, the detention after uh, or this means the punishing after fair trial and conviction by the court so we go to the court court finds us guilty and they detain us and we get the punishment now preventive detention what it means is detention without trial and conviction by court to prevent him from committing an offense in near future so these are the difference between the punitive detention and preventive detention now let us go to the part 4 and let us see what uh, it says it says no law providing for preventive detention shall authorize a detention of a person for longer than 3 months so first thing it preventive detention shall not be more than 3 months unless let us read further an advisory board consisting of persons who are or have been or are qualified to be judges of high court has reported before the expiration of the said period of 3 months that there is in its opinion sufficient cause for further detention so what it says is advisory board consisting of high court judges reports for sufficient cause of extension and second part what it is saying is uh, b such person is detained in accordance with the provision of any law made by parliament under sub clauses a and b of clause 7 so clause 7 is there we will study that and if certain provision have been made by law uh, by the parliament then if it says under certain classes this preventive detention has to be more than 3 months uh, in that case also there is an extension of preventive detention and this 3 months will not hold good Uh, the part five which says when any person is detained in pursuance of an order made under any law providing for preventive detention, uh, the authority making the order shall, as soon as uh, may be, communicate to the person the grounds on which the order has been made and shall afford him the earliest opportunity of making the presentation against the order. So it tells us two things: first, grounds of detention should be communicated. and opportunity for the detainee to make a representations against the order see it says nothing in clause 5 shall require authority making any such order as it referred to in that clause to disclose facts which such authority considers to be against the public interest to disclose so what it says is facts to which uh, the authority thinks it is uh, it will go against the public interest need not be disclosed again this is the exception of this coming to uh, part 7 article 22 it says uh, parliament may by law prescribe these three things these three things parliament can prescribe if you can see on the screen detention of more than 3 months in certain circumstances and classes maximum period of detention for certain circumstances is classes procedure which has to be followed by the advisory board so this advisory board who is consisted of uh, the high court judge okay so what procedure they have to adopt uh, to uh, increase the preventive detention it is also uh, prescribed by parliament so this what article 22 tells about let us have a review it is a big article first thing is in case of arrest within 24 hours we have to be produced before uh, the magistrate okay and no further uh, detention if magistrate doesn't authorize not applicable to any mis case and in case of preventive detention we understood the difference of punitive detention and the preventive detention then uh, preventive detention shall not be more than 3 months unless a advisory board consisting of a high court judge reports for sufficient cause for the extension for the preventive uh, uh, detention Uh, then it says the grounds of the detention should be communicated and an opportunity for the detainee to make representation against the order the facts considered to be against public interest need not be disclosed okay then parliament can make laws for these different cases in case detention of more than 3 months is required in certain circumstances and classes and maximum period of detention for certain circumstances and classes and procedure which has to be followed by the advisory board
this is what article number 22 tells us let's move other move further and uh, let's go to write against exploitation till now we have finished two rights under fundamental rights first was the right to equality from article 14 to 18 then second what is was the right to freedom from article number 19 to article number 22 now we are moving to the third fundamental right right against exploitation let us see article number 23 what it tells us uh, it says prohibition of traffic in human beings and forced labor Part 1, it says, traffic in human beings and beggar and other forms of forced labor are prohibited and any contravention of this provision shall be an offense punishable in accordance with law. So again in accordance with parliament intervention comes here and they have to prescribe laws for the punishment for these offenses. It tells us first thing it tells us the traffic in human beings. What it means is the selling of men, women, or children. And for this, uh, Government of India or uh, Parliament passed Immoral Traffic Prevention Act 1956. Second term, what it uses is beggar. Beggar means work without remuneration, forced labor, that is work without will. So it talks about three terms. First is the traffic in human beings. Second is the beggar. And third is the similar forms of forced labor. So beggar means getting the work without giving any remuneration. And forced labor that is getting the work done without the will of the labor. And to uh, enable this, Government of India, Parliament passed these two acts, Bonded Labour System Abolition Act 1976, Minimum Wages Act 1948. There are many other legislature also which have been passed by the government to put it, uh, this particular fundamental right. Now go to the uh, part 2 of uh, 23. It says, nothing in this article shall prevent the state for imposing compulsory services uh, for public purposes and imposing such services the state shall not make any discrimination on grounds only of religion, race, caste, class or any one of them. So this is an exception to the above law. It says the state now can impose compulsory services like military services or other social services but there should not be any discriminations while allotting these uh, particular services. It should not happen. They will allot uh, these services only to a particular religion or caste. There should be no discrimination, but a state can impose compulsory services without any remuneration. So this is what article number 23 tells. Let's move to the other article, which is article number 24. It says prohibition of employment of children in factories. Uh, no child below the age of 14 years shall be employed to work in any factory or mine or engage in any other hazardous employment. So it says prohibition of employment of children in factories etc. No children under the age of 14 to be employed in hazardous activities while what it infers is they can be employed in harmless activities. Uh, this is a sequence now of what uh, legislations have been passed. The Child Labour Prohibition and Regulation Act 1986. The Child Labour uh, rehabilitation welfare fund was established uh, then commission for protection of child sex 2005 government banned children said domestic workers 2016 all from uh, this restriction under 14 also it was removed and uh, no child will be employed as a domestic workers in 2006 and this there has been proposal now to make a proposal of uh, child Adolescence and Labor Protection Act. So, this was introduced in the winter session uh, last time in Parliament. Now, this particular act, which will further make stringent uh, provisions uh, regarding the prohibition of employment of children in factories, etc. Child and Adolescent Labor uh, Protection Act. There is a proposal now, it was put up in the winter session. So uh, here we complete again uh, the third right, 
right uh, against exploitation uh, next class we will start with right to freedom of religion and uh, next class we will finish till fundamental duties so after finishing the fundamental rights in part 4 we will study uh, the directive principle of state policy then uh, uh, we will study the fundamental duties and uh, after that we will start with the union of india and it won't take much time after that in polity actually so whatever explanation are there the major explanations are there with the fundamental rights and dietary principles state policy and understanding the fundamentals initially in the introduction class after that it doesn't take much time and it is very easy also uh, the toughest part I would say it is the uh, election of president okay so this is the toughest part election of president to understand how a president gets elected in India uh, otherwise it is very factual and once we will be doing the union simultaneously we will see the clauses of uh, the state as well so for example when we are studying the president part we will see how government uh, how a governor in a state actually is in relation with the president or the different uh, uh, clauses related with the uh, governor similarly when we are seeing the parliament we will also see the state legislature so that is how we will finish both the parts the union and the states and similarly the judiciary part so after that it won't be it won't take much time in Indian polity and in last we will study or we will do the last uh, 20 year question papers so thanks for tuning in last class we are going to start with article number 25 right to freedom of uh, religion